Welcome to Total Fit Heads. Serious fitness for not so serious people. Hey, Fit Heads. Today we have Dean Somerset. He's a strength coach, a personal trainer, and got a bunch of certifications. Welcome. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, so Hopefully I can fit in with the Fit Heads. <laughs> Be like, I think you just did. <laughs> So I'm just going to say, well, okay. Give, give them a little bit of background about what you and what you do. I'm like I said, I'm a trainer. I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. It's above freezing right now, which is always nice. Um, I'm uh, actually certified as an exercise physiologist. So most of the clients that I work with are injuries, medical conditions, the kind of the worst of the worst, what you would expect to see coming into a gym that makes up the majority of my clients. So if uh, a normal trainer says, I don't know how to work with that person, that's where I come in. I've got clients who are Paralympians, uh, people who've won gold medals and world championships, people who are recovering from spinal surgery, and, uh, average grandparents and moms and dads looking to stay fit and healthy. So my goal is just to try to help everyone the best I can and get the widest range of people possible and getting fit, getting awesome, and lifting all the heavy weights and fist pumping like champs. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so when you say worst of the worst, it's still people that are like actively want to be in the gym, right? Okay, cool. Yeah, and usually like the clients that I work with are, um, to, to give an idea today, I had a client who's had two hip replacements, two knee replacements, who also has multiple sclerosis and colitis. Um, the client I just had has advanced Parkinson's and is barely mobile. Um, I also have had group training clients where it's a 40 year old executive and people that are just working out and having fun and trying to lose weight and stay fit. So that was what today was. Oh, it's a pretty wide range of making people be more awesome. <laughs> exactly. Okay, first question, why am I in pain? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. that, that's a good question. And we were kind of doing a, a little bit of a soft lead into that earlier where it's like, hey, you're a trainer. Can you diagnose my shoulder injury at a cocktail party? Um, it, it's one of those kind of things that has so many layers to it. It's like ogres. There's onions and layers. You got to dig deep into the layers to find out what's going on. It's not quite like trifle. It's not that straightforward. So when you're digging into why someone has pain, there's usually a, a relation between things like the biomechanical elements. I do this and my shoulder hurts because something's getting pinched. Then there's the psychological element. What do you think of pain? Or do you have any kind of post-traumatic stress when it comes <laughs> Are to you kind a of pain? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's not even as much that, but it's like, what do you, what is the relationship between pain and you? So if you, let's say you were in a really traumatic car accident and then you move some way and you relive that pain. And then that's something you're just trying to avoid at every step of the way, the way possible. So your ability to avoid pain or feel pain is going to be different than my ability to avoid pain or feel pain, different than that's different than everybody. So it's going to be, what is that relationship of pain to you? And then how are you coping with it or dealing with it? If it's something where it's just, front of mind and you think about it all the time, even though there's physically nothing wrong with it, then that's going to be something that's different than me saying, well, this is sore, but we need to make sure that that becomes less sore. So that's why it's so hard to be able to dig into concepts at a cocktail party and say, hey, here's how to fix your shoulder. It's, well, why is your shoulder sore in the first place? Is it because you sit in an office for 70 hours a week like this, and we just need to be able to get the shoulders to pull back and do something different and take some of the pressure off of that area? Yeah, maybe. Is it because you were in a car accident and you have like whiplash compound with neuralgia from a pinched disc in your neck or something like that? And that is a different problem altogether. Is it because you've had multiple injuries and you just have every single time it just layers on post-traumatic stress? It's going to be a, a little bit of a different process. So why are you in pain becomes a really deep layered ogre-like problem that uh, if nobody's picking up on the Shrek reference, I just kind of dated myself. Yeah. That, that's all right. <laughs> Shrek is super Mimi. You're you're fine. I see it yep. everywhere. Exactly. So topical. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I've heard that like because of childbirth or whatever it is, women have a higher tolerance for pain generally. Have you noticed that or is that not something you can pick up on? It's tough because I mean, like I said, people experience pain differently. If guys were delivering babies, I think they would be the biggest wusses on the face of the earth. <laughs> I mean, think about how bad a man flu is or a man cold. Now imagine man childbirth to go along with that. It would just be atrocious for everyone involved. Um, I think that in terms of what men and women can do, women typically can handle way more work and way more discomfort in the gym than men can. 
when men start getting to the point of like past their two rep max, they start giving up a little bit sooner. Women, that two rep max becomes a 10 rep max pretty quickly. So it's something where I think that women, when it comes to the physical outputs, will tolerate a lot more work than men will. And they'll dig deeper into those burn components because that's just what their physiology allows. Men can lift more in an absolute manner, but women can lift way more reps in a relative manner. So if we were to think of like 90% of your one rep max, women will dominate men at 90% of their one rep max for the number of reps that they can do. That's crazy. That's mm -hmm. so cool. I mean, I always use this like one rep max calculator and just like assume that, you know, I'll be able to do this because this, but really there's so much mental there. And obviously they should have a woman one rep max calculator. That's <laughs> way better. Yeah. <laughs> Because, I mean, a lot of those one rep max calculators were based off of Olympic weightlifters, young college men. So they're not necessarily going to be appropriate for powerlifting, and they're definitely not going to be appropriate for women, because that's just not who the sample was that they were picking from. So for a lot of the time, women, it's like a, 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 an extrapolation. It's more of an exponential curve than it is a linear curve, whereas with men, if they're doing percentages of one rep max it's a linear curve so 90 percent of one rep max equals three reps for women that might be five reps but it might also be at like 85 percent they might be able to get eight or nine reps out of that whereas a guy might get four reps so huh. it's a little bit different based on gender normative values as far as how much work they can do and like i said women just dominate men when it comes to relative percentages of one rep max and the amount of work that they can do that's crazy. This just like blew my workouts wide open because yep. ju like just this week I switched from a strength to hypertrophy section and, and I'm like mad at myself that these, these tens are so easy based on this calculator I'm using. I'm like, what the heck? My one RM should be higher. Or is yep. it that, that I'm just able to do 10 at a higher weight and my one RM is, is not me being a wimp. No, I mean, both of those are really valid criticisms and concerns when it comes to percentages. But a lot of it just comes down to that calculator wasn't made for you. <laughs> and uh, it's not about you being good or bad or anything like that. It just might mean that when you do your first set and you're like, that was really easy, we'll throw more weight on it and then do another set of that weight. Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, when, you, when you're talking about like pain being a mental aspect of this, do you feel like kind of a trainer and a therapist is that like <laughs> what you're doing in the gym good point i mean you can't really separate out the brain from the body and i, I just had a little bit of a tweak on my back about a month ago and I, i've just gotten over it now so being involved in the process like with in first person view it gives you a little bit of a different idea as far as what's going on i mean you go through all the emotional components you go through all the psychological what if I do this? Is it going to trigger it? What do I, how do I brace? How do I move? And then you go through all of the biological components of, okay, well, I need to train this pattern. I need to move. I need to do all this. And I know all that stuff intrinsically because I've studied it. I've learned about it. I work with people who do it all day long, but to go through it is entirely different. So when I'm trying to teach people about what they're feeling and about how they're getting better and how their progress is actually occurring, yeah, you have to kind of put on a little bit of a therapist hat once in a while, knowing your boundaries and say, well, I'm not going to, diagnose somebody's medical conditions or split personality disorder or anything like that but it's going to be more about hey you know what you're you're entirely valid to feel this way and here's why and here's what this is actually doing and here's the things that we got to be able to figure out how to do and if we're not able to figure that kind of stuff out maybe there's a therapist out there who does know pain science that i can send them out to to be able to work with them a little bit more in depth but just getting them to understand that if you have a bad back bending over to touch your toes isn't going to make your back explode. It's going to be something that you might feel that way. And we got to prepare you to be able to do it effectively. But then when you actually do it, it's fine. So it's got to be something that the person's ready to do physically, but then also ready to do mentally. So the therapy element of things, if you want to call it the therapy, is more just helping people to understand what the physiology is and why their body is setting up barriers and walls and resistance to doing things that might cause further pain. Interesting. Is that a part of the assessment when you bring someone in? And in general, like, what do you do physically too? Whenever you're you're starting with someone, is this like a, a week of just like watching their body move? <laughs> well, it's part of that. I mean, obviously, in a single assessment, I can't pick up every single feature of a person and what's going to work and what's not going to work with them. But a big part is personality typing and figuring out who that person is in front of me and what's driving them forward. 
If I have somebody who's very A type and they have to be the best at every single thing possible, okay, well, what they're going to experience for pain is going to be different than somebody who's very meek and mild and catastrophizes every single element of everything. If I come in and say, hey, how is your day going? And they launch into this spew of negativity about how everything is going wrong in their world. Okay, well, their pain tolerance might be a little bit mm. different than somebody who's like, everything is awesome. I'm at the gym. This is going to be awesome. I'm going to move. And my back is a little bit tight today, but I know that if we warm up and move around, I can do this. But let's just hammer it. Let's deadlift. And it's like, okay, well, those are the people I got to kind of pull the reins on. I got to make sure that they don't like run themselves into the floor somehow. The ones that are the really meek and mild and they're trying to make the world into everything falling apart. And they're the ones that I kind of have to say, okay, well, you can do this. Or I might have to trick them into seeing that they can do something. So I've got uh, little games that I play with people. I try to mess with them psychologically once in a while where it's like a, if there's something on the floor and I know that they're hesitant to bend down and pick stuff up, I'll get them doing a set and we'll get talking about like their cat or their work or movie or politics or something. It's like, oh, hey, can you go grab that thing over on the floor and bring it over here? And then I watch them just out of the corner of my eye. And it's like, if they go over and they grab it, stand up and come back over to me, I let them know, hey, you know that thing that you couldn't do before, like mm -hmm. bending down to pick something up? You just did that and you didn't even think about it. So that changes their brain around. It's like, wait, I, I did? I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to go through my 30 steps of preparing to bend down to grab something and pick it up. So once they can acknowledge that, and then we can start reinforcing that, then it starts becoming something where they don't even think about it anymore. They can just bend down and grab it and pick it up. If it wasn't a physical limitation, then we can actually get through it much more effectively. That doesn't mean that it's always that simple and easy, but that's just something that does have to be a component of the assessments. So how do you know when somebody's ready to just grab something? Well, I mean, it comes down to what are the underlying precursors. It's like, what is the stuff that has to be there to begin with? Do they have pain with basic range of motion type stuff? Do they have pain with muscle contraction? Can we do lead in exercises that would be like a hip hinge or can they brace well or are they coming in walking normally? All that kind of stuff. And have we done something similar to it but I know that they can do that kind of stuff without problem. If somebody's got a really cranky shoulder and I say, hey, I just want you to reach up and grab something off the wall and they do it without side bending, hitching their shoulder and doing something funky. Okay, well, if they just go straight up into it, great. But if they have to take those 10 steps, they're not ready for it yet. It's not going to be something that I do on day one where it's like, hey, I want to play with dynamite. Let's see how far I can go. And then yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden they bend down and they wind up having a spasm and they're down on the ground and saying they need an ambulance. Wouldn't be a day one kind of thing. That might be a day two or day three or day four. I want to see how we can actually get into those layers before we start peeling them back too far. <laughs> Well, when you're talking about like the spectrum of like meek to like the dynamite, uh, where, how often are you having to like bring, pull people back? You know what I mean? I mean, I know where I fit, where I think I fit on the spectrum and why I opened with, <laughs> why am I in pain? Because I feel like I need someone to pull me back. But is that common or is it mostly just like you, people need motivation? It's a little bit of both. I mean, I find that the people who are very competitive, uh, they're the ones you have to pull back. So it depends on what the person is competitive about. If it's somebody who's an endurance athlete or a weightlifter or a power lifter and their drive is that sport, then you got to kind of pull them back a little bit. If it's somebody who is exercising or training because of a problem in their life and they're trying to address that problem, you might have to pull them back. So that problem could be anything from uh, self-image issues to relationship to work to whatever, but they're using exercise as a coping mechanism. So it's tough to be able to figure that one, but right. it's something that definitely has to happen you know, where you have to have that conversation. It's like, okay, well, what is your goal set and why is this so important to you? And why are you driven into this? If they just love working out and they're like, yeah, I'll work out. But if I want to take a day off tomorrow, that's not the end of the world. Great. Okay. So then it's just a matter of programming, setting up, making sure they're following the program. If it's like, okay, well, here's the program. And then here's a pre-programmed day off. And they decide to go to the gym and do five hours of cardio that day just because they cannot take a day off. Okay, well, we have to have some conversations about why that is and what you're actually getting the benefit from in these days off and why they're important. And maybe we can find some different ways of structuring your workout plan so you can get the benefit that you're looking for, but we can still make sure you're physically getting the work that you need and the rest that you need more specifically. For the people that are really meek and mild, they're, they're scared to dip a toe in the water. 
they don't want to do anything that's maybe even going to possibly result in a problem down the road. So we got to kind of motivate them and coax them and push them through it and actually kind of guide them into the process by saying, hey, you picked up that thing off the floor. That was awesome. So now let's find another thing that you can do really successfully. Or they're the ones that are like, I'm not making any progress whatsoever. And then you're having to find all the silver linings of all the small victories that are guiding them along the way that they're just not seeing. And if you can show them the small victories and how they're adding up, they'll start to buy into the process more. But yeah, it's definitely a big challenge to be able to figure out who the person is sitting in front of you and what their driving features are that are making them either show up to the gym or avoid the gym. Interesting. You'd be surprised too. I mean, you right off the bat, you think like the, the big tough guy is going to handle more pain and go further. But once in a while you run into some guy, we had a guy on my team in college who was just quiet, sort of meek, um, mm -hmm. polite, nice guy. But we'd be like, yeah, how you doing? You doing okay? He's like, ah, you know, I'm a little sore. I don't know. I just don't feel good, but that's fine. End of the season rolls around. Turned out he had Lyme disease for the entire season. <laughs> so I think people are sort of different in the way that they, you know, yeah. I, like I know personally, if, if I get a hangnail, I'm on the floor calling for an ambulance <laughs> immediately because you know, I'm such a big, tough guy that if I'm in pain, then we must need to go to the emergency room. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I've had guys where it's like, no matter what happens, they're never ready to train. Like yeah. you could have them show up on the best day of their life. They get into the warm up and like, something's not right, coach. My back is, my shoulder is, my, I'm like, okay, well, can you move it? Can you do all this stuff? I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll do warm up. Uh, you know, something's just not right. It's just not moving the way it's supposed yeah. to. It's like, yeah, because you haven't actually trained in six months. You've been thinking about warming up and getting under the bar, but you've been <laughs> chron chronically stuck and not ready to actually work out. So, okay, well, pitter patter, let's get to work. And those are the people <laughs> that are, you kind of have to kick them in the butt and give them a little bit of tough love, but. If you were to try to do that with one of the meek and catastrophizing clients, yeah. their world would fall apart. So the, the addressing of the person's concerns is going to be very individualized as much as the way that you design the workout program, as much as the percentages of one rep max, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's where you start separating the good coaches from the great coaches is being able to tailor how you approach an individual from yeah. one situation to another. Mm -hmm. You mean my monthly fee for just an online program isn't covering that? Darn it. <laughs> it might. I mean, depending on who the yeah. coach is and what they're actually including, I, I don't doubt that there's a way that you could include some of that. Um, it's just very difficult to do on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, you'd have to have a really sick funnel to be able to put that into place. Where sick you start funnel. To identify <laughs> Hi, are you a crazy person? In which direction yeah. are you crazy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like, are you a Pfizer, or do I have to pull the reins back on you? And now here's your pre-programmed day off. Now here's what to do when you skip your pre-programmed day off. Yeah. <laughs> I can definitely relate to that hypothetical woman doing cardio on her day off. It's Yeah, it's been recently that I've finally been focusing. I mean, I know that recovery is important, but it's now I'm like trying to beat it into my brain. I do have notes here being like, ask him about deload weeks and recovery weeks. <laughs> yeah. Like how important is that and how often and can I just not? <laughs> can you just not? Yeah. Well, part of it comes down to, um, it's not just about that week. It's about what's happened for like the two or three or four months leading into that week. Is this something that you're doing every single month without fail? It might be something to say, well, we probably might not need a deload week. Now I found that for clients, if they train three days a week or less, they don't need to deload week because the rest of their week is a deload week. If they train four days a week or more, that's when they start needing to have a bit of a deload week. And that might not even necessarily be a deload, but maybe more of a cross training. Week. So that's where you just do something to shake things up. You break the patterns, you keep them a little bit more emotionally invested in things, but give them something to spice it up. It might be that instead of doing like max effort powerlifting, you switch up and do, okay, we're going to do ridiculously intense mobility work for a week and it's going to be something that sucks but you're going to actually have a shoulder that doesn't hurt by the end of it and it's going to actually help you to get under the bar more um one of my clients is a really advanced barbell athlete she does powerlifting and olympic lifting coaches both sports and has taken people to nationals and gone to worlds herself so she has spent a lot of time with the barbell for the last two months i've given her a whole bunch of gymnastics rings exercises so we're doing a bunch of calisthenics, body weight, so Russian push-ups, uh, hollow body holds. Okay. It, it, it's where you go down into a push-up and then you rock back onto your elbow and then rock forward onto your hands and then press up. 
Dang. So yeah, so like I've got her oh, working right. on okay. essence. Ooh. Yeah, we're essentially progressing towards being able to do like muscle ups, kipping pull ups, front mm -hmm. levers, back levers, all stuff that's actually going to be very valuable to doing her barbell sports. But and looking dope huge, on Instagram. <laughs> always. I mean, that is where the bread and butter is, right? So if she's able to do that kind of stuff as like ridiculously intense work, it's breaking the pattern of barbell stuff that she knows how to do inside and out. And she's probably not going to get much benefit from anymore anyway, because she's already at the upper end of that strength curve. So if I give her stuff that's requiring ridiculous shoulder stability, ridiculous core strength, timing, positioning, body awareness, everything that's going to play into her barbell sports, she's going to see some benefit from the cross training, but it's also going to break her out of the same patterns and habits that she was doing before where she was getting all the niggling little overuse injuries of her back, her hip, her shoulder, all the stuff that's normal and say, okay, well, let's put you in an entirely different fish tank and see how you can swim. And she's having fun with it. And she's actually seeing progress in her lips. The other day she PR'd in her snatch. So something's got to be going well with that. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. Makes me want to take a ballet week. <laughs> not a bad idea okay. I mean if you take like on your deload weeks if you say I want to do something I've never done before and then you do two or three classes of that knitting have fun with it power knitting <laughs> power knitting it's got to be like <laughs> knitting so hard that you sweat you're just like <laughs> no 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 you you knit while you sprint <laughs> sprinting like how many sprinting. blankets per hour can you get <laughs> Sprint it blanket, Blankets per mile. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down. Or you create like Good. a spin class with knitting. You're just down there and spinning. Oh, yeah, because you're not doing anything with your hands except... That's weaving, yeah. isn't it? it? It would be like cycle bar where they have yeah. the weights and they do upper body yeah. dumbbell stuff, except you would just be knitting it up. And we, I'm telling you, that's Love the it. next group fitness class that we're going to start putting out there. And it would be fun. And you get heavy, the heavy knitting needles. They're like 20-pound needles. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you you're gonna be rich and you're knitting jumps. chain mail obviously because <laughs> i mean that way you can actually bite into it when you're done yeah. that's how intense the workout is you're gonna be biting what you knit we did uh me and ali did a uh a, a, a weighted drum sticks a drumming cardio class yeah. yeah it was great the sticks were heavy ish what is the dumbest workout class you've ever taken um I don't know about the running dumbest. <laughs> is my answer. <laughs> Actually, funny story on that. Um, last July, I was in Australia and I was about to miss a flight from Sydney to Vancouver. So I had to sprint from the internet, from the domestic terminal to the international terminal, which was a good country mile. And I may not look <laughs> like much, but I'm, I'm wiry. And seeing a large 245 pound Canadian man sprinting through a terminal screaming, get out the way because I'm going to miss my flight. Apparently that does damage to my feet. And I wound up developing some plantar fasciitis after sprinting through a terminal and then sitting on a plane for 14 hours. And it took about Ooh. eight or nine months to start resolving. So one of my goals with this whole quarantine was like, I'm going to fix my foot. So I actually started running to fix my foot. And it worked. Really? Oh, like build yeah. up strength instead of having it. Like yeah. You load the tissue, you give it time to rest. You load the tissue, you give it time to rest. And that actually worked to produce a benefit where I was actually able to say, yeah, my foot actually feels better when I run. I completely didn't expect that to happen either. And I'm kind of shocked that I was able to come to that conclusion, but some days you got to experiment. Interesting. Huh. Mm -hmm. I know I'm sure in quarantine, my feet are like get, just not getting the exercise like where I, I used to kickbox. And so you're just like on your toes all the time. And now I'm just like sitting on this yep. couch all the time, <laughs> which by <laughs> yeah, the way, yeah, yeah. I need to lean back. Yep. Lean back. Fat Joe style. Yeah. <laughs> Again with the references. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did Not mention culture. It's a lifestyle. <laughs> love it. Um, the mobility thing where like, okay, maybe you're a whole, just a whole week of like foam rolling. I don't know. How, what is your take on the, how much mobility and foam rolling we should be doing also? And or talk us into doing mobility. Yeah. Convince from me. zero. Well, I, I can't. Which I can't, I, I would only imagine you have to do with, I don't know, 105% of your clients. Yeah. <laughs> Surprisingly, like, because I've written about it so much and talked about it so much, people come to me saying, I need more mobility. So oh, I've already yeah. kind of been, they've already been pre-sold on the concept. A lot of it comes down to what do you need to do in order to do the stuff you want to do? So mm -hmm. if you can already squat to the floor, do you need more mobility? No, you're there already. 
if you want to do gymnastics and be able to compete on the Olympics, you probably don't have enough. So that's when we need to work on more. Mm -hmm. If you're having trouble even getting a, and close to seeing parallel in your squad, we might need to work on getting a little bit more mobility, especially if you're looking at competing, because if you can't get to parallel, you get three red lights, you're out and you don't even get to bench press and you don't get to deadlift. And if you don't get to deadlift, what is the point of the world? So, <laughs> so true. We, the point of anything. <laughs> so if you don't have that mobility, it's going to affect your sport. And that's kind of the number one reason to do it. If you're somebody who is, you can't put your arm over your head and that's an important part of your life because either you need to be able to reach up to grab stuff over you or you're an Olympic weightlifter who needs to put their arm over their head. We need to get you that mobility. If you want to work mobility just to feel good and to get the happy drugs released in your brain, great. That's a reason too. If you're overstressed and you need some way of sleeping more effectively, there's ways that you can utilize mobility to kind of increase parasympathetic stimulation and bring yourself into more of a ready state to sleep. Great. That's another reason to do it too. If you're doing mobility just because you think it's something that needs to happen, it's like trying to bring fetch back. It's not going to happen, right? So we, we got to be able to do it in a way that's going to be beneficial and positive, but at the same time, goal-oriented. And if it's goal-oriented, you're more likely to do it. If it's something where you just say, well, it's this nebulous thing that I know I probably should do, but I don't know why, and it's not really doing anything for me, you're not going to want to do it. So make it goal-oriented and make it specific to actually – what you're trying to do and if you don't need to do it let's find something different for you to do i think you just convinced me not to do mobility honestly i can <laughs> sit in a full squit full split for instagram i've achieved mm -hmm. what i need uh i don't i mean i guess it's the, <laughs> like it's not oh. holding me back from any of my workouts so then like wow so now it's just about you know maintaining mobility just maintain and not feeling have. guilty Wow, yeah. this has like certainly changed how bad I feel about myself around this subject. Cool. Yeah, and it might be something to say like as a self audit and a warm up or on a deload week where you just kind of go through basic patterns and say, how's my hip feeling after I just did so many deadlifts and squats? How's my shoulder feeling after I did bench press or overhead press? Do I still have that mobility or is it restricted in some way? And if it's restricted, okay, we'll spend two or three sets working on a couple of drills that would help get that range back. But if it's not restricted, why would you want to work on it more? If the door is already shut, don't shut it further. It's shut. Leave it. Just do your thing. But that's like separate from foam rolling, right? That That's like you should still foam roll even if you're mobile. <laughs> kind of. I mean, it's, it's one of those kind of things. Foam rolling is uh, it's like a very poor man's massage. So if you find that you're not stiff, you're not tight, you're not sore, you're not having a lot of the stuff that would hold you back. Foam rolling isn't going to make you any less of those things that you're not currently. So it's cool to do as like a self audit. It doesn't cost you anything. And if you go through an area and you're like, oh, that's actually a little bit tighter than I thought. Okay, cool. I'll spend a couple more minutes on it. But if you're foam rolling and you're like, nothing is sore, I don't feel like I'm getting any benefit from this. But some dude on the internet told me I had to do this for a half hour <laughs> every day and the internet never is wrong, so I'm just going to keep doing this and wasting time, well, it might just be a waste of time for you. So if you do a self-audit and you're like, I don't feel like this is doing anything for me, okay, cool, then it's not doing anything for you. Move on. I've got some clients who never touch a foam roller because when they use it, it just never does anything, and they're coming into the gym to work out once or twice a week. So for them, how beneficial is spending five minutes on a foam roller versus doing five minutes of literally anything else. <laughs> Scrolling Twitter. <laughs> Maybe not that. They do that on their own. I want to make sure that they're, if they're going to do scrolling Twitter, it's going to be power scrolling with Twitter while they're using the heavy scrolling fingers to go through the big <laughs> Twitter wheel. Sure. Well, if you're saying that like foam rolling is just a cheap massage therapist, like do you suggest people go to massage therapy like totally. regularly? When needed. I mean, it's definitely something where like a good analogy is foam rolling is like brushing your teeth. A massage therapist is like going to the dentist. So mm -hmm. you'll go to the dentist on a regular basis. And there's some times where you might need to go a little bit more frequently. So that's my example of how to go to a massage therapist. So if you go for a massage, if you're really competitive and you're training a lot, I would definitely recommend going more than once or twice a year. If you're somebody who just really enjoys having a massage or you have an injury or a 
high stress lifestyle or a, a job where a massage makes you feel a lot better, definitely go more frequently. If it's something where you find that you're great, but then all of a sudden you're not, and a massage would be really valuable, go more frequently. Yeah. <laughs> and another thing that uh, some people may or may not skip, not me specifically, uh, activation and warming up, like what are your thoughts on all of that? Um, a, a good way to think of this is you're trying to use those drills to get better at the stuff you want to do. So if you're finding that your squats and your deadlifts are just feeling sucky and garbage, if we could spark up your nervous system and get your muscles to contract harder before you jumped into that and you were able to lift the weights that you're trying to lift more effectively, put more weight on the bar and feel like you're ready to run through a brick wall, would you want to do that? I would, but yeah. I've never like done an activation drill and been like, my goodness, I'm superhuman now. I'm more like, should have been scrolling Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe I'm but doing I'm it wrong. wrong. I mean, it is possible that the activation drills that you're doing just aren't quite your cup of tea. So especially if you find that you're a very mobile person, you might need a more like high threshold, like really tension developed type motor drills versus like range of motion, stretchy based type stuff. Because if you already have that mobility, we might just need to be able to get it so that it's more tension developed, especially if you're looking to lift heavier stuff. So that's where you can get into things like plyometrics or... Uh, post-activation potentiation type drills, all the kind of stuff that's going to make you turn into an absolute fireball of neural intensity versus somebody who can do all the yoga poses and moves in the world and then try to call yourself a power lifter. It's, if you want to lift a heavy weight, Pretty much you me, actually. <laughs> do a T. <laughs> but that, that, that's the thing that I find. It's like, okay, well, if you have somebody who's very mobile, mo more mobility drills are redundant. You need to have that person be able to do stuff where they're going to be able to utilize that mobility and generate force. If you have somebody who's ridiculously tight and they can't even get into position to get the benefit of the exercise, mobility is important. That's why you need to do more of like the static stretching, the long hold, uh, the activation stretch warm up type drills, getting the tissues gliding and doing all that kind of stuff. Those are the people that they're meant for perfectly. But it's going to be the exact opposite of what somebody who's very mobile would actually need because they're already there. They don't need that more separate mobility. from from like activate like I hear this either truth or myth that you need to like turn the muscle on. I know that I have trouble getting my butt to fire or whatever example it is, and you mm -hmm. you need to do something to like tell your butt that it's gonna do a squat before you just squat. Like warming up a squat is using your butt. So where do you stand I, on that? <laughs> so think about if uh, you woke up tomorrow morning rolled out of bed and then tried to immediately get into position for a max effort squat. Like I'm talking immediately, the alarm hasn't even like gone off, like okay. gone quiet yet. And you get up and you're like, okay, max effort squat. How ready <laughs> for that exercise are you? Probably on a one to 10 scale, negative 7,000. So you need to stagger to the bathroom. You need to do what you do in the bathroom. You need to get the coffee. You need to scroll the Twitter. You need to see what's up on the ground. You need to actually get to the gym, get your heart rate up, get your muscles feeling good. That's all activation, but just in different ways. So if you're not quite ready to squat, squatting isn't gonna go all that well. Now, if you wanna do activation drills because you maybe have a sleepy glute or something like that, it, I'm, I'm a big fan that, of saying that muscles aren't sleepy, they're just not positioned to be used effectively. So unless you actually have a severed nerve leading into your glute maximus, it's not sleepy, it's just not being utilized effectively. So then we got to figure out ways for your brain to actually say, make that muscle squeeze. Now use it. Now use it harder. Now use it faster. Now use it harder. Now use it faster. All right, let's put a barbell on your back and use it the way that we were just training you to use it. And the warm up should replicate what you're trying to do. And it should make what you're trying to do better. So if that means that we do glute activation drills, okay, well, just doing 50 sideline clamshells isn't going to replicate what you're going to do under a barbell. So we got to be able to, that might be like a step one where it's like, okay, can you feel the glute muscle flex? And if you can't feel it flex, then it's not flexing. Let's find a different position, get that glute muscle to flex. You can feel it flex. Now absolutely murder it. I want you to use so much intensity that you feel like that muscle is going to rip off the bone. And now I want you to be able to do it harder and faster. Now let's put a barbell on your back, do your warm ups with an empty bar. And every single rep, you are murdering your glutes. I want you to squeeze your underwear until it begs for mercy. You're going to crack walnuts. You're going to crush diamonds. <laughs> you are going to do so many glute focused things to get you ready to get under that bar. Because if you don't, you're not going to use them when it comes to, when it comes time to do in your squat. 
So that is activation because now you're using muscles to do the thing that you want to do. And you're replicating the environment, you're, repli you're replicating the intensity, and you're replicating the actual motion that we're actually trying to do. So that is what the activation is. You're just doing mindless reps is mindless and not really all that productive. So do something that actually gets you what you want to do. Does that uh, also translate to st stretching? And, and how effective is static stretching? I thought you, I wasn't sure if you were a fan or not. Static stretching has a role. It, and it's something that, that just like any tool can be used for certain things. Uh, if you want to use static stretching to decrease tension, fantastic. You'll be able to decrease tension. You want to sit there and watch episodes of TV tonight and you just want to hang out and stretch and feel like you're just chilling and getting comfortable and relaxed. Cool. It'll do that. For a pre-workout, it's probably not going to be all that good. In terms of developing mobility changes, it's one of the least effective tools out there because it doesn't do anything to affect the actual physical components of what would be resisting that muscle to actually stretch out. So it's not doing much to change how the nerve is firing into the muscle, why it's contracted in a shortened position. It doesn't change the capsule. It doesn't do any of the stuff like that. Static stretching is really powerful if somebody has any kind of joint-specific restrictions. So at a good example, my wife dislocated her elbow last year. So she fell off her track bike, put her arm out to break her fall, and it broke more than her fall. So they popped it back in. She was slung up for six weeks. And then when she got out of the sling, she didn't have full extension out of her elbow because the joint capsule became fibrotic. So for that, all of the ligaments and tissues just sh shrink wrapped and saran wrapped tight on it and would not allow any motion to occur. So what they had to do was actually put her into a flexion splint and an extension splint for eight hours a day in each direction. So you want to talk a long hold static stretching, eight hours <laughs> holding one position. That's why they put a splint on it to push that position. So if you're holding a 30 second stretch, it's probably not going to do as much as an eight hour stretch. <laughs> and it's going to take a lot longer to see the kind of results you're looking for. But if you're doing a lot of capsular type stuff, it takes a long time. If you're doing just changing the neural tone into a muscle, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, it'll make you feel like the muscle relaxes and has a little bit better time, but it's not going to necessarily change your mobility. So the only way you're really going to be able to do that is to make the muscle contract through a range of motion, make it the capsule allow you to access that range of motion, and then be able to do stuff with some level of intensity. If you've got fortunate joints where you can drop into a squat, put your arms over your head, do a back bridge, then you're lucky. You're good. You're, you don't need any more capsular stretching. You, that's already done. You, your capsule is as stretched out as it needs to be. You might be able to benefit from saying, oh, I'm just going to do a hurdler stretch because it feels good and I like it. Okay, cool. You got tight shoulders, eh, hang out for a pec stretch for like 20 or 30 seconds, no problem. If you actually have like rotator cuff adhesions or adhesive capsulitis in the shoulder, that 30 second pec stretch isn't going to do deadly squat to open up that joint. It actually has to do something more. So that's where you have to start looking at why is a static stretch being used and how effective is it for that specific modality? We can start drilling way down into like, are you using positional stretches or using time-based stretches, all that kind of stuff, but it's a tool. That's all it is. So if it's the right tool for the right job, it's going to produce results. If it's not the right tool for the right job, it won't. So Max, you need like a overhead something to hold you for eight hours so you can get that ohp yeah, just hang on a pull-up bar for eight hours it's perfect. perfect yeah oh, yeah just go for just go for a dangle i mean the new batman movie is going to come out soon so you can just prepare for it so you're just going to dangle like a bat hanging out overhead and by, just my, be like, by oh, my feet yeah no but you can just do it by your arms you're going to be the new batman <laughs> right side up, man. Man. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I can't touch my toes. I've always struggled with very, very, I'm very inflexible. I don't have any mobility in any way. Um, it never bothered me other than I was super embarrassed by it. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's always been something I'm like sort of freaked out about. The scariest thing for me is those stories where somebody gets into like a car accident or whatever. And because they're so flexible, they're just like, Oh, I'm fine. This is totally fine. Whereas I would be on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. If I fall break off bicycle or something. I'll, yeah. I'll crack well, like an egg. The funny thing is the people that are hypermobile, they're the ones that typically have the worst whiplash or hypermobility related type of injuries. So the people that are really stiff, it's like, they're, they're like a tennis ball. They just bounce down the road. 
the people that are like the marionette puppet with the strings all discombobulated, you overstretch them and give them whiplash. They're the ones that have the hardest time coming back because they don't have the joints to hold together. They've got to rely on all of the active supportive structures to keep things together. I mean, most of my clients that have had things like SI joint injuries, whiplash, they are on that hypermobility spectrum somewhere. So it's tough for them because the people that are really stiff and fibrotic, you're not going to budge their SI joint. You would never have SI joint problems. Mm -hmm. You got somebody who is very hypermobile and they go for like a one mile run once in their life and they have a lifetime of SI joint issues just because their joints can't tolerate that loading. And it's not like, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much of an exaggeration to say that. Is it at all age related or is it mostly just like whatever you're born with? It's a little bit of both. I mean, as people age, they'll get stiffer. Um, but if somebody is genetically hypermobile, they're born with that, that's in their DNA, their tissues are built that way. So there's a difference in the amount of elastin and collagen that hypermobility type people have. So elastin is very stretchy, it's very loosey-goosey, that's why it's called elastin, because it's like elastins. Collagen is really stiff, thick, strong type stuff. So if I'm somebody who's very stiff, I have way more collagen, not very much elastin. Somebody who's very hypermobile has way more elastin and very low or weak collagen. So if I have somebody that doesn't have that structural stiffness, we can't build that. I mean, unless we literally change your DNA, we're not going to be able to change the type of connective tissue that that individual is born with. We can stretch them, we can contract them, we can do all that kind of stuff, but that is just what they have going. And we can do a lot of things with people, but changing their DNA is not one of them yet. Once I can figure that out, I will charge <laughs> a lot more money. Yeah, come on, that's yes. got to be coming, right? I mean, working out now is just like sitting in a chair and they put some needles in you and then now you know Kung Fu and you have pecs. And you can also fly a helicopter too. Mm. Love it. I know Kung Fu. <laughs> <laughs> I saw something on your website. Um, I've heard of progressions. What are regressions? Um, so a progression is when you make an exercise harder, and ex a regression is right. when you make an exercise easier. Well, so let's uh, say well, that, guess, okay. when, yeah. when so let's say that? that I'm getting somebody to learn how to do a movement. So I want them to be able to deadlift. So a progression of a barbell deadlift would be adding more weight to the barbell or deficit barbell or sumo deadlift or something like that. A regression might be to get them to learn on a, a kettlebell or we just do a hip to a wall tap. So we get them to learn how to disassociate, how to move their hips without flexing their spine or doing a squat. So a regression is usually, usually used as a teaching drill, which is fantastic. I know there's like a half naked guy walking around behind here. So that's going to be a nice little video piece. I mean, it's a public area, but yeah, whatever. You got to tilt it down a little bit. Well, then you get to see a different view. <laughs> you ask him yeah. to flex or... <laughs> um, So yeah, a regression is more of a teaching drill or teaching individual components of more complex skills. So yeah, if I have somebody right. trying to learn how to do something like a clean and jerk, uh, the first movement is a deadlift to be able to do that first pull off the floor. So we get really good at a deadlift and then they have to learn that second pull phase of the shrug to be able to get the bar into a catch phase. So regression is just teaching the individual components of that complex movement scale to be able to get them to learn how to put it all together. It is the layer of bread in the sandwich of awesomeness. <laughs> Ooh. I have a uh, very self, another self-serving question. I guess they're all sort of self-serving, but. Stop it, this is for it. the fit heads. Let's try to phrase it in a way that <laughs> is helpful for a lot of people. Yep. Uh, a lot of people are home uh, don't necessarily have access to um, a lot of workout equipment. They're doing a lot of home workouts now and for the foreseeable future, at least in USA, not in a, I don't need a Canada flex, another Canada flex. Uh, okay. Your gyms are open. <laughs> <laughs> what about people who are doing sort of like repetitive lightweight exercise, body weight stuff at home? Is there anything they should watch out for? Is there anything they should focus on? Um, First, are you enjoying it? If it's something that you actually are looking forward to, want to do, and can conceivably see yourself doing more of. If it's not working for you, you're going to start noticing things start hurting a little bit more. And that could be during the exercise or the day after or two days after where you're like, hmm, my neck, my shoulder, my back, something just doesn't quite feel right with the workout that I'm doing right now. And that might be a time to just look back and say, okay, well, what was I doing? where there's certain exercise that might have been working that area more so. 
maybe just adjust the program going into it. If you have really limited uh, equipment, there's a ton of stuff that you can do body weight, and there's a lot of free workouts out there right now that you can capitalize on. There's also a lot of coaches out there who specialize in doing workouts for different body positions, different uh, goals, whatever your requirements are, and also whatever equipment you have available. So everybody's going to be in a different scenario for what they can do from a financial perspective, from an environment perspective, from an equipment perspective. But the best thing that you can do is make sure that it's something that you enjoy and that you feel is actually fulfilling the goals that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, it's okay. Jeff Hallowy who, who suggested you and is the reason that we are, we get to chat with you today. He's he's convincing me that I, I should not just be training by myself any longer. I've reached a point where I may just be reaching out to online help, you know. I don't know, have you like what, what's the difference you've seen with like meeting with someone in person or just working online? Well, it's definitely different. So I mean, if I'm working with somebody in person, the first thing I do is look at their eyes and see how they're feeling that day. So if somebody comes into the gym and you look at their eyes, you can tell a lot about what they're going through. And I can tell pretty much in the first 20 seconds whether or not they're going to have a good workout or a bad workout. And it's like, hey, how are you doing? And I look at their eyes and you can tell they've got bags under their eyes. They look like they're fogged over. It's not something where it looks like they're well rested and ready to go. Or if they're coming into the gym, chipper bouncing and ready to rock and roll. <laughs> and it looks like they're sparked up and ready to tear the place apart. Okay, that's going to be two very different workouts based on just looking in their eyes. If I say, hey, how are you doing? And it looks like they just become completely deflated because they have somebody asking them about them versus saying, this is great. I'm awesome. This is awesome. It's going to be a different day. I don't get any of that online. So I can't really see what that person's going through other than what they might send me for an email update or what kind of information they might enter into on their daily logs. So all of it is kind of reactive in online training where, they're, where it's more proactive when it's in person. So I can see what they're doing and I can say, okay, we're going to call an audible and we're going to switch out the workout to this, this, and this, and this. You look like you're pushing really hard today and you're having a great time. Let's test for some PRs. You look like you're struggling in the warm up. Let's back off a little bit and work on some different patterning. Let's talk about what's going on the rest of your life. Maybe we do need a program deload, all that kind of stuff we can do in real time in person because they're right there in front of you. You can't really do that as easily online. It's got to be more about the communication with the individual going back and forth between the two of them to make sure that I'm meeting them where they're at, but that I'm also able to help to hopefully predict the future as far as what the rest of the workouts are going to look like. Whereas I can't really do that as easily compared to in person. Yeah. We talked to somebody else or uh, another trainer um, and they were like, Oh, we're starting group classes. <laughs> and I was like, are you live streaming or are you, do you zoom? And they were like, well, we started out just live streaming, but then we realized we had to zoom so we could see, <laughs> yeah, well, we could there. see the person getting trained also. Yeah. Right. And, and it's a challenge if you got like 20 people in there, because if you've got all these tiny little boxes, you got to like creep yeah. right up to the camera and be like, <laughs> <laughs> doing that kind of stuff. So it's like, if you've got a big enough display, you can see them and you can point at them and call the names, but yeah, it's going to be a, a growth phase for a lot of the industry to figure out what to do. I think a Maybe. lot more trainers are probably going to pop onto OnlyFans and oh, to yeah. actually run Patreon, classes. same thing. Yeah, so it's yeah. going to be something where instead of paying a gym membership, you pay like a Patreon or an OnlyFans yeah. monthly membership to be able to do that kind of stuff to be able to support the gym. But I think there's also enough people out there who are doing stuff in their own way that it's going to be a challenge for any one trainer to be able to find a foothold unless sure. they're really good at what they do. Mm -hmm. Or really hot. Only I mean, fans. Come on. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> yeah, this five head doesn't just attract the ladies. <laughs> there was something. Pull. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask back when we were talking about arrest, the mm -hmm. the central nervous system, like that. This is also just like a thing I hear, but don't really know. Like, how often am I? Should I be rest? Like, what is? How does that tie into all of this? And how will I know when my CNS is doing okay? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a couple of ways that you can measure it. They're not direct ways, but they're ways that are still appropriate. Um, if you check your resting heart rate in the morning and you notice that it starts going up, you're not quite recovering all that effectively. Along those lines, there's a lot of biometric trackers out there. So Fitbit, Aura has a ring that you can wear. My wife uses a whoop strap. Yep, 
So they'll give you a whole bunch of detailed data to be able to say, you're recovered, here's what your sleep was, here's what your heart rate variability was, you're ready to train really hard, or you're in the yellow, so you're kind of stressed, but not really, you can still train if you want to, but just adjust, or you're in the red, your life is ending, please mm -hmm. just curl up in the fetal position and, and think about happy thoughts. <laughs> so if you have the ability to track that kind of data, and you're willing to pay attention to what it means and say, well, okay, well, I'll adjust my plan based on this, 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 and this, great. That would be able to give you all the information you need. For a lot of the time, the CNS is going to get really stressed out when you have a lot of work-life stress, when you have a huge amount of volume of work that you're doing in the gym, or when you have a sudden increase in volume or increase in intensity. So let's say that you used to do three sets of five, and all of a sudden you do seven sets of 30. That's a big increase in volume, and your body's going to feel that pretty quickly because it's something very different than what you used to. If those three sets of five were... 100 kilograms, and now you move three sets of five at 120 kilograms, that's a big increase. So your body's gonna feel that for a short period of time until it either adapts to it or until you give it a recovery. So that's on the, the periodization plan, you've got uh, initial stress, detrain, super compensation, and then back to normal. That detrain component is where you're stressed out and your body's going through a recovery phase. The super compensation is when you've recovered enough to see that increase in performance. So if you hit your body in that stress phase where you're on the decline, you just keep going down and down and down. So if you were to go to the gym seven days in a row and max out seven days in a row, you would feel terrible come day eight because you just haven't given yourself enough time to recover in between those max efforts. If you go and you just train in a medium pace and you just get into the gym, do your work and get out and you feel like you didn't completely obliterate yourself, you could train eight, 20 days in a row and not feel like you're completely destroyed. It's the days when you really increase volume or really increase intensity, or you exist at a higher intensity or volume and don't give yourself the time to recover. That's when you start getting into the overtraining state. And that's where your CNS starts to take a beating. And does it matter what you're doing? Mm -hmm. If I train um, pushing something with my arms really, really as hard as I can versus just legs, or is it overall body? <laughs> well, in, in terms of your CNS, your body will recognize it as stress. So if you're training hard and heavy, if it's a deadlift, you'll probably lift more absolute weight because the compound movement allows you to lift a lot more weight. If you're doing max effort bicep curls, you're going to be intensely lifting, but you're not going to be putting as much stress on your system as a max effort deadlift, just because mm -hmm. the leverage of the weight is going to be entirely different. So the amount of muscle mass that you're working, the amount of stress that you're putting on your body with something like a deadlift is going to be considerably more than a bicep curl or maybe an overhead press. If you're an absolute unit and you can overhead press more than you deadlift, you'll probably put more on your more stress on your system that way. But uh, for most people, it's going to be the total stress that they encounter. So another good example is uh, endurance athletes. If they're runners, if their mileage starts creeping up or if their speed starts creeping up and they don't have enough uh, redu reduced days like the low intensity steady state days that's going to put more stress on their systems for a lot of my marathon runners if we increase their weekly mileage too fast they burn out too quickly so that's when we have to start pairing back and making sure that we don't push that fire too hard mm -hmm. so it's still going to be stress on the system whether it's endurance activities whether it's strength training whether it's work-life balance whether it's not sleeping all of those things are still stress on the system and will lead to cns fatigue Interesting. So then like if you have a really hard leg day that really stresses out your CNS, then you shouldn't do chest to the next day, even if you haven't done chest in a week, because you it's all one you system. You still could, but you would definitely feel it. So if you went in, you were doing a very hard leg day, and then you went and did a very hard chest day, on day three, you would feel like you just couldn't walk or comb your hair. And you would feel like, but it's pull day. You got to do pull-ups. <laughs> yeah. And how do you think that day is going to go? Yeah. Like you just did okay. two really hard days in a row. And then that third day you're coming to the gym thinking, I can't, something's not right. Cause you're tired. Yeah. You haven't recovered properly between the two. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that you're tired. So you can't put out the same level of intensity as you did on day one and day two. So that's where rest and recovery becomes important. But there, it has to be within reason. There's times where you want to stress yourself and you want to push and you want to overreach. Definitely, there's time and place for everything. But then you have to understand, like there's a cost of doing business associated with that. If you're going to push that hard, you need to be able to relax for a day 
give yourself a chance to sleep, get some good quality food in you, manage your recovery to make sure that you can push hard on those consistent days. If you're a boss in the gym and you're able to manage your recovery and you can train heavy and intense every single day, great, more power to you. Some people can't. Like for me, I found that when I'm training hard, four days a week is my max. If I go more than four, I'm just not being productive anymore. Interesting. Yeah, it's like counter to what I thought like the point of bodybuilding splits were is like you could just go every day because uh, while your yeah. legs are recovering, then you're working on your triceps. I mean, you do definitely get that rest and recovery from the body part, but then it's again, that yeah. accumulated stress one day after another. So mm. that wears the person down as much as anything. And if you've ever trained like a bodybuilder, you know that it's a very fatiguing process to go through because there is just so much work to do. So it's tough and fatigue plays a role in everything you do. Stress plays a role in everything you do. So that's where if you are a bodybuilder and you're doing a split like that, you have to manage your recovery. Because if you start missing workouts or you can't put out the same intensity or work volume, you're not going to get the results you're looking for. So recovery is important and it's something that has to be paid attention to when volume and intensity start going up. So as a trainer, how do you train somebody to recover? Do you just stare at them while they sleep? <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's what we do in Canada. We break into people's houses <laughs> and we stare at them while they sleep. I mean, we don't lock doors up here. So yeah, it's just so you're doing great, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, we, we talk about the importance of sleep. We talk about, do you have a sleep routine? Do you actually have a system in place to help you get the best quality sleep? What's your nutrition look like? Are you giving yourself time to rest? Are you giving yourself time to think about things other than the gym or about work or whatever? Is your work or uh, home life so regimented and structured or so chaotic that you don't get a break? If that's the case, then it's going to be harder for you to get the recovery that you need in the workouts. So let's start digging into the stuff that's going to affect recovery and start talking about ways to make it better. It's never going to be perfect, but if I've got a single mom of two kids who's looking to compete in marathons, there's no way in hell she's going to be able to do any level of self-recovery care in her calendar, especially if she's working 40 or 50 hours a week and trying to run 20 hours a week on top of that and ferry kids around in school and COVID and all that kind of stuff. So Thanks. it's like, okay, well, what can we manage? What are the low hanging fruit that we can take advantage of? Adoption. Where we can see the biggest bend. Yeah. Adoption. Yeah. That would be a good way to go. <laughs> it's like, all right, you got a dad somewhere. Go find one. <sighs> but yeah, it's like, okay, well, what can we do now that's going to have an impact in a positive direction? Is it yeah. you put down your iPad for 10 minutes before the end of the night, before you go to bed and you do two stretches. Okay, well, that might be reasonable. Is it you wake up five minutes early and you do a little bit of journaling? And cool, that might be possible. Is it you send the kids to bed and then you get to bed at 10 o'clock versus getting to bed at midnight? Little stuff like that. Yeah, the idea of super compensation, like I knew what it was, but I didn't have a word for it till you. That's awesome, right? You want to recover so that you're better than you were before you kicked your own butt. That's awesome. <laughs> we're learning. Hashtag science. Right? All right, Max, you want to give them the one question we give everyone? Yeah, we asked something. Uh, it's it's kind of personal, but your professional opinion, how much do you love drinking? How much do I love drinking? Well, I, I, I'm a connoisseur and uh, a connoisseur, a vagabond, ne'er-do-well, all of these things rolled into one. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely enjoy having the ability to imbibe once in a while. It's not something that really runs in my life, but if I'm going to be asked, what do I want to drink? Well, it depends on what you have. You have some like rare top eagle sitting on the top shelf, or you're going Knob Creek. And if Knob Creek, what variation are you working with? Or is it a summertime where you're going gin and tonic style? And are you going with more of like a Blackford's? Or are you going Monkey 47? Um, what type of tonic are you using? Because good and bad tonic will make the drink completely different. Now, also, are you mixing anything with that? Have you ever tried limoncello with gin and tonics? It makes you incredibly explode with happiness in your mouth and other body parts too. Um, if you go it's with slightly hungry, set, right? It's an aperitivo. <laughs> uh, the limoncello can be an aperitif, but at the same time, it's also something that just adds a little bit of citrusy. Now, along the same lines, if you go triple sec versus limoncello, it's not quite got the same mouthfeel, but uh, it does give you a little bit of that orange citrusy type base too. Wow. So yes, I do like to drink. <laughs> the opposite of the answer a trainer would give that is, you can't drink and work out. Uh, you can't be fit and have alcohol. Yeah. So, Did you smell it. a beer? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it is like, if you're only training and not enjoying life, why the hell are you training to begin with? 
So you only get so many trips around the sun. So if you enjoy experiencing the world around you, you are going to have so much more enjoyment out of those times around the world. If you're only in the gym, please get out of the gym and enjoy the rest of the world. There's so much more outside of those four walls. The squat. the squat rack should be about making the rest of the world better for you, not about being your entire world. Love that. Was, um, we asked that because that's sort of why, that's one of the big reasons why we started this is that me and Allie like to work out, but we like to live a life and all the fitness professionals and all the training videos and, you know, fitness pros, they were like, you know, you, you have to eat chicken and broccoli every meal for your entire life and you can only drink water and you know how dare you what what, what do you mean you had a vodka soda you know what i mean like yes yeah. so we like to ask people partly because we're one we're <laughs> we want to be validated <laughs> <laughs> and partly because we want you know other people to know that that's not the the case yeah i mean i mean those people are a very small subset of the world there's okay. the rest of the world out there and they don't think the same way or feel the same way. So, okay, let's meet those people where they're at and actually be able to have a conversation with them about something other than macronutrients. <laughs> Wiser's Canada Whiskey. That's a name drop. It is. Uh, Crown Royal, if you get the Northern Harvest, it actually won the award for best whiskey in the world a couple of years ago. Really? Ooh. Yes. We're doing it next beer mile is whiskey. A whiskey <laughs> mile is a completely different process than a beer mile. I love that really? you know that. You've yes, done one? Yes. Oh, what? not just one. <laughs> How do you think How'd we make it, go? it through the winters? How do you think we make it through the winters up here? If it gets to minus 40, we have to find ways to have fun. So <laughs> drinking, studying, and working out are definitely a part of that. And have you ever been to Canada? We drink. We eat maple syrup and we skate. That's how we live life. <laughs> wow. What's well, the difference between a whiskey and a beer mile? Well, a whiskey mile, you drink whiskey. A beer mile, you drink beer. So when you drink the beer, you've got the pint. So there's the volume that you have to contend with and the mm -hmm. sloshing around in your system. When you drink the whiskey, it burns on the way down. And then you have to deal with that happening with your cardiovascular uh. system. So every time you breathe in and breathe out, you've got, uh, you got the whiskey <laughs> breath going. So it's different. So if you drink the beer, you've got a pint in you for every lap that you do around the track. Mm -hmm. And you just add four pints of sloshing fluid fermenting into your stomach if you add four shots of whiskey it just adds up in a different way and you wind up getting drunk way faster with the whiskey just because it's on higher alcohol content so by the time you yeah, get 12 ounces one, every four every lap <laughs> yeah so i mean but in the first lap you're feeling like bulletproof the first whiskey shot yeah. you take you're like oh okay this is going to be something by the third one you're pretty much stumbling and like falling <laughs> over your own face wow and yeah so that's that's the whiskey mile so i didn't think about sometime. that I, I just doing. thought it would be easier. I didn't think about like breathing fire the entire time. Oh my God, Max, we have to do this. We literally did better? a while last week. It's so easy. No, whiskey. Much even better. Whiskey squats. <gasps> oh. What? Whiskey squats. Huh. Whiskey squats, whiskey deadlifts, whiskey anything. You, you do that, then you're going to go for an entirely <laughs> different whiskey world. Whiskey anything. Yeah. Or you could beer, do a beer set where for every rep of an exercise, you chug a beer. You get to like You're your top set. Right now. You get to like your top set of like max effort fives or max effort threes, and it's like you line it up, do a beer, pull a rep, do a beer, pull a rep, oh do a beer, God. pull a rep. Yep, and it, it's got to be at that max percentage of one one RM. Uh, Ali, you might have to do more reps. So that's all right because we already talked about. <laughs> yeah. it. That's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. There's something special coming to my fitness outrageous channel. I think. We have to try this. <laughs> Put that on YouTube. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, where can the Fitheads go find you online? I have a blog, deansomerset.com. I have Instagram, dsomerset1. There's another one. There's another account on there that is mine, but I forgot the password, so I just set up a new account. <laughs> um, I have a YouTube channel that's essentially Was it deadlift? Exercise. Did you try if it's... <laughs> no, it was... Part, I think it was actually like Dean Somerset, and then I forgot the password. No, I mean so your I password. No, it wasn't deadlifts. No, I, no, it wasn't that. But yeah, I just didn't yeah, bother yeah. to reset the password and I changed my email address. And it's a whole thing. So <laughs> I set up a new Instagram account. It's mostly just videos of me deadlifting in my basement. So um, I also have YouTube, but it's mostly exercise tutorial videos. So if you want to see right. 700 different versions of exercises, give that a click. Yes, I do. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, go. his blog has a bunch of awesome articles. So go check it all out. And thanks again. And thank you to the Fitheads.
If you haven't subscribed on Apple Podcasts, please do that. And please rate and review. Uh, reviews are like the, the biggest thing we've learned that helps the podcast. So if you're listening, you would make us exceptionally happy if you did that. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>